Thanks very much, folks. Uh, so, my name is Dave from uh, Kazakhan, and this is the third episode of Lockdown Chats. Uh, so, this series is a series, uh, the whole idea behind this was bringing the comic panels that we're all used to, uh, bringing them online. And uh, But obviously, with the lockdown and with the pandemic and people using Zoom, we have this new thing that we're working there. Uh, just get people all across the different all different parts of the country and stuff like that. Um, so this series is being brought to you in association with Clare County Council Arts Act Grants. So they're sponsoring the whole thing and uh, so really appreciate that. And uh, this is our 2000 AD special. So how is everybody? Very fine. <laughs> hey, <good>. so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so look... Yeah, it's a bit it's a bit weird having so many people on it, but sure we we'll work away through it. Uh, oh, so, nice t shirt. <laughs> thank you. There's a there we go. Hey, that's how you know. <laughs> so guys, uh, just saying um, the speaker turns green and they're the person that's going to be broadcasting. So if you're not speaking, you're not broadcasting, so you're okay. Um so that's how it works, just in case you haven't used it before. So first off, guys, I'll just say uh, <laughs> Talking shillelagh. Whoever had the shillelagh would be in charge of the conversation with that. So okay, that might well, be practical. I have a paintbrush, so I have the paintbrush. So can I hand it over to <laughs> okay. you, PJ? Uh, no, so listen, guys, I'll just get you to introduce yourselves and uh, let people know who you are. And uh, like the, the team of this chat, uh, we're going to keep it conversational, but it is kind of 2000 AD Judge Shred, but it's not exclusive. You can talk about anything. Uh, but ideally, we were talking about uh, people who have want to become a writer and want to become an artist and what they need to do. So that's kind of the, the slant that we want to go for. Yeah, we, we should help our future competition. Is that what you're saying? Oh. I think so. We give them all the worst advice available. Oh, well, that's a, that's a good way of doing things, you know. We can actually, actually what we could do is we can get them on it and then just start making up stories about all those people. That's what we do, make up stories. Oh, well, <laughs> um, yeah, so on, on the chat today, we have uh, Maurig McHugh, um, PJ Holden, Owen Coveney, and Michael Carroll. Uh, so we'll go through the, the list there, and we'll uh, just get each of you to introduce yourselves. So, Maura, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> Still alive. <laughs> um, I, I live in the west of Ireland in Galway and I write in a variety of media. So I've done uh, novellas and theatre and uh, some uh, film and comics and prose. So of, when it comes to 2000 AD, I've written um, Anderson um, uh, for uh, the magazine. And I've actually written a couple of one-shot stories for other rebellion titles, which aren't 2000 AD, but were within the same cozy home of rebellion. And uh, then I've also written um, Psyche, which is a novella that Michael Carroll uh, was the series editor on. It's in the Judges series, which is the pre, it's in the 2000 AD sort of a universe, but it pre to This one. Yay, thanks. Oh, that's... You're good. welcome. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and so I do lots of different things, but that's um, the kind of, within this wheelhouse of what we're talking about, that's what I've been working on. Oh, yeah. We, we'll go a bit more into that, some of that stuff in a few minutes of how you got down to 2000 AD mm -hmm. in the background. But uh, so next up is uh, PJ Holland. How are you, PJ? I'm grand, thanks. I do, should do a proper introduction, shouldn't I? I'm, yeah. Hi, I'm PJ. I'm TV's PJ Holden, uh, star of radio and screen. Um, I, I'm PJ Holden, star of comics. I, I don't know what I am. I, uh, I'm best known for drawing Judge Dredd for 2000 AD. Somehow, I don't know how that happened. Um, I've been doing it for about 20 years. Again, not sure how that happened. Um, but I've drawn lots of other things, war story stuff mostly with Garth Ennis. I've got a graphic novel out at the moment called The String Bags, which is also with Garth Ennis, which is a war story. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I draw a lot of comics. That's what I do. Very good. So, uh, so you're based up in Belfast? Oh yeah, I'm in, and I'm in Belfast. That's the, that's the north. I'm, I'm a Nordy. <laughs> so uh, we don't have the equivalent word, I don't think, for 
Saudi, Saudis, I just, that's no, that's Saudis mm-hmm. is wrong. That's Saudi Arabians, that's completely the wrong word. Mm-hmm. I don't, s- s- Southerners, I, that's all, that's all I've got. They're called Irish. <laughs> the Irish, the, for the proper Irish. Like yourself, PJ. I, I just well, think I mean, we, I think we might actually need John Hume back. I think he just went a bit too quick. <laughs> might need him on this call here. As um, most people from Belfast knows, the further outside of Belfast you get, the more Irish you become, that's... That's the way it works. The moment, the moment you leave the waters here, you become very, very Irish, no matter which side of the, the uh, field you play on, as it were, in Northern Ireland, you bec- you're Irish, you just embrace it. You get all those potatoes in, dance a little shillelagh, I don't know. <laughs> Wear a shamrock in your hair. I don't know what, what we do. Who put do batteries that? at home today, huh? <laughs> I haven't spoken to another human being. Oh, I wasn't married to your father <laughs> in like months. Okay, I think I think we might have to go on to Owen Covey and completely apologise to Owen, your follow PJ. So sorry about that. Great honour to follow PJ in anything. Um, so am I on? I don't see a green thing around. Oh, you're on. You're on. Yeah, you're on. Okay. So you don't see your own green frame then. That's interesting. Anyway. Uh, I'm Owen Coveney. I'm an illustrator and sometime comic artist. I would say most of what I do is for print illustration for books, magazine, press, board games, anybody who paid. Very That's good. Finished. Next. Very good. And uh, <laughs> next up we have uh, Mr. Michael Carroll. How are you, sir? I love to be there, David. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm on my car. I write uh, Just Dread and Proteus Vex and a few other things for 2000 E. I, I also do books and, and, and such like that. So uh, I've, I've worked with everybody except Owen, which is odd, you know, because I always think I've worked with Owen, but we haven't actually worked together on anything oh, yet. No, we will do soon, I'm sure. Yeah, I'll but, uh, be yeah, but I've worked with Morda uh, uh, ed- editing her, her awesome novel, Psyche, which, which is interesting because. Um, it was one of the easiest editing jobs I've ever had because it was just going, yeah, that, that's fine. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. <laughs> that was good. But uh, yeah, and of course, me and PJ have worked for years on, on Judge Dredd, on and off. Though for some reason, it hasn't happened in a long time, and I suspect um, he just told Targ that he didn't want to work with me anymore. To, to be honest, uh, Michael, I'd ask specifically that I wouldn't be on this chat with you, but yeah. you know, <laughs> apparently that could, I was being too fussy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, next up, we'll uh, we'll go back to the next question. Um, so I kind of uh, I'd like to ask people how they got working in 2000 AD. So what kind of uh, what was the background like? What were you doing? Were you did you study writing in college? Did you study journalism, or how exactly you fell into it, or what was the love? So uh, Mara. Uh, how did, how did you get onto the track I, I, of 2000 AD? Well, I've always loved comics, and actually I read 2000 AD when I was a kid because there wasn't a lot going on in pre-internet Ireland. <laughs> you know, we were like, what could you actually get your hands on? It was like whatever was available, you know. So I read um, my local library dry as much <laughs> and uh, anything I could get. And, and I loved 2000 AD. And actually I loved Judge Anderson. She was like a real hero of mine when I was growing up. So, um, and I got all the original collected editions when they first came out. Um, and uh, so to write her was really, I mean, that was amazing. So that was the first 2000 AD story I read, I wrote and it was in the, a magazine in the uh, um, 2018, the summer sci-fi spec. And it was a one-off story, uh, short, very short, uh, called Spa Day, and, uh, uh, which isn't as fun as it sounds <laughs> for Anderson. And after that, then, I pitched more work to Targ, and uh, then I did some work with, uh, with Targ, which is Matt, sorry, we all call Matt Smith Targ. <laughs> so uh, I forget yeah, Matt Smith, the editor, who's who's really brilliant. Uh, I pitched him more work, and he said he went with it. He, you know, we discussed the stuff, and then I also worked with um, uh, Keith Richardson for um, the the other work that I'm doing, which is I was 
story. I have a story in the Smash special and I have a story in the Misty Scream special coming up. Um, and then I've got a one-off Anderson story coming in the magazine. And I'm actually doing some more prose work with Rebellion as well. But it's, sorry, just to backtrack very briefly is that yes, I've always been interested in writing and I actually um, did lots of different things, including, um, uh, I, you know, I studied English in college, but then I went back and did a master's in screenwriting and actually screenwriting was probably the best, uh, most useful thing when it comes to writing comics. It's not the same, but it's actually closer than say writing prose. Very good. That's quite interesting. So you've done lots of stuff. You've written uh, stage plays and you've um, like, what, what was your journey? So you, you did the, the script writing course and what, what were the first bits and pieces of work or what did you work on? Well, screenwriting is a terrible industry. <laughs> it's very, very hard. And it's, 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 it's very difficult to get into, especially at the time when I finished in Ireland, which is quite divorced from everywhere, met other industries. So what I did is the classic thing is uh, just go where the opportunity arises. So I wrote a lot of prose. Um, it's easier to get into prose. I got short stories um, published and then I just followed whatever opportunity it presented. And when I got a chance to write comics, I just took it. You just say yes and you learn on the job. And that's what I did with with it yeah so i like to work in different media because each one strengthens uh your writing in a different way and that's why i like and and also just quite simply projects get stalled and sometimes they get stalled for years and years and if you sit around twiddling your thumbs you have to go so i keep moving and looking for i always say it's like the shark you have to keep swimming or you die <laughs> absolutely that's uh, some of my experience as well and, and people don't realize that, that like for the amount of projects you get published that there's oh, yeah. 20 or 30 that never see the light of day uh, so what was your experience of getting the very first 2000 AD script or how did it work out <laughs> well it was simple i had pitched to matt before uh, years previously and he'd said no which is typical and you don't take that personally um and uh, but I had had a lot of work coming up and stuff being published, and then finally um, they had an opening in this, and he just approached me, and uh, I literally nearly fell off my couch when the email arrived. Yeah. So he he actually approached you, did he? Mm -hmm. He did. Very but good. we had met. You see, like I say, I pitched to him. Um, we had met at Thought Bubble. Um, we'd actually had a really good, uh, really interesting, good, uh, nice conversation there. And, uh, and he knew I was working. So when he had a slot come up, he, it, it just, he approached me. So Very good. that's how it that's, works sometimes. That's really Wait, When you said, Moira, that he approached you and you nearly fell off your couch, I assumed he was at your front door. No, just, I wish. Just, he turned <laughs> up, I fell off my couch. I went, Jesus, Lord, what are you doing here? I was, Moira, I was you're brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, I got the email on my phone and I was on my couch I, and I let out a very large uh, exclamation, which wasn't PG, so I couldn't tell you what that was, <laughs> and uh, went down to the office and told my husband the news. It was amazing. It was a real big day for me. Yeah. That's it. That's excellent. So a lot of people have uh, different experience with the pitch and pitch and pitch, but you have a really nice uh, way how, how it worked there. Well, like I say, I had I had pitched them to to him before, um, and it's just you know you just keep working in the industry, and then they see that you're working, and then they you know when they have a it's, sometimes it works out that way, and other times it's pitching, um, you know um, I've had both experiences. Excellent stuff. Uh, so PJ is after switching his place there. So Owen, you are no longer after PJ <laughs> or before PJ. So Owen, uh, what was your story? How did you uh, get the first gig in 2000 AD? Yeah, I just remembered uh, I should start writing things down because as soon as I finished speaking, I realized I'd said absolutely nothing about what I've done for 2000 AD. Um, so <laughs> I had basically, a bit like Mora, I had been sort of pitching him, Matt, uh, Tharg, whoever you, you want to call him, for about three or four years. Uh, I'd met him in Birmingham at some 
ICE, I think it was, or something, and uh, he'd had a chance to go through my portfolio. So um, I'd say it was about six rounds of pitches, to which the answer was always no. But um, I noticed as I pitched more, there were fewer criticisms. So in fairness to Matt, he will always... Everything gets seen, for first of all. Every sample and every submission gets seen. And he will write you a letter, usually brief, but telling you what you could do better. So the list of things that I could do better got less and less with each submission until the point where I just sent him something and he just emailed me saying, how about, would you like to do a future shot? That's very interesting. So did you you do the... Sounds like you wore him down. I did. It was, a it was a campaign, actually. I, I call it, I refer to it as, it was really just a campaign, you know, and... I've said all these things to him already. I just no point in repeating it. I'll just, I'll just, yeah. I'll see, just give him some work. Yeah, exactly. It's just, it's patience, really. I think most people ask, oh, what's the secret, you know? The biggest secret is patience and not, not, not stopping, not giving up. Oh, and uh, patience and stupidity. That, those are my two <laughs> biggest yeah. weapons. Very useful for me, I find. Yeah, mm. It's really worked out well for me, being bloody-minded. Uh, and, you know, and somebody tells me I can't do something, I think, oh, damn it. I'll prove it now, just to just yeah. to bite him that I can, you know. So that that certainly played a role as well. But um, uh, you know, I mean, I, it was a long kind of circuitous route for me. I went to art college, did some did design for a few years, then I got into storyboarding, TV commercials, and advertising, and that was the money was lovely, but creatively I wasn't really evolving. So I just started about. I'd say six years ago, um, I finally broke through to 2008. Before that, I'd been working for magazines and stuff and seeing my work in print. And I've always said that seeing your work in print is one of the best kind of education you can get because you see what works and what doesn't. Um, and that really, really helps um, working for print. Well, something can look great in your desk, but it may not translate sometimes. So... Um, in a very circuitous way, I hope I answered your first question, Dave. No, no, that's perfect. Uh, no, that's what it's all about. So, like, everyone's route is very, very different. Um, so you didn't have to sneak into Matt's couch and frighten him off the couch, did you? Uh, no, no, I think, so. I think maybe that might have jeopardized my future with him somehow. <laughs> so, uh, if, as a point of fact, if Matt decides to fight you on the couch, best to let him win. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, so, Mr. Michael Carroll, uh, so when when did you start in 2000 AD? I think the first uh, first thing I published was in 2007, I think. But I was reading comics since day one, since the very first issue. And um, yeah, I, I, got, I got in by um, sending off future shock ideas and, and scripts over and over. Until eventually, um, yeah, it wasn't so much that I wore him down as he got, just got so used to me that I was, suddenly I was like, it's Stockholm Syndrome. Um, <laughs> so we, with Matt, I, yeah, Matt's a great, great editor and um, he is able to pinpoint exactly what doesn't work in the script with what you need. Uh, one of my scripts, um, I, I, I've told the story so many times, I'm not even sure if it's true anymore, but I was writing, a sh uh, I was editing a short story Drilling a short story competition. And I just for fun, I mean, between me and the other judges, I come up with a list of all the worst cliches that you always get when you're doing a short story competition, which is stories about Adam and Eve or time travel or dinosaurs or Marilyn Monroe or who really killed JFK. We've all seen these things so many times. So I decided one day I'd write a story with all the worst cliches in me. And eventually I got the idea of uh, doing this story which um, I, I, I my first future shock was basically Adolf Hitler goes back in time um, accidentally goes too far back and uh, himself and Eva Brown become the first man the first woman Adolf and Eva and it's a simple simple joke but uh, with that one I sent the idea to Matt and he said I like the basic idea but this doesn't work that doesn't work and I went ah oh, here we go but then I thought alright so I got back to him and said if I make some changes, will you have another look? And he said, yes. Mm -hmm. And then I went, <clears throat> maybe I should have done that the first time around rather than just accept his no. Um, so I made the change, sent off the script, and he got back to me and said, um, yeah, send me an invoice. And I went, yay. And then I said to Michael, him, 
How do I do an invoice? How does the title of it? <laughs> genius. Yes, I'm waiting for right. the title. <laughs> well, the title is Back to the Fuhrer. It is actually a great story. Oh, mm. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, it was drawn by Gary Erskine, who brought it to life. Amazing. I, I, I'd never uh, even met Gary before, but it was like, as soon as I saw his work, I went, this man is my new best friend. He is just awesome. Great. And uh, yeah, so I was, I was overblown with that. And my second, you know, real comics, the comics fans of my era will, will know this man's name. My second Future Shock was drawn by John Cooper. And he used to draw Johnny Red and things like uh, One Eye Jack and all that sort of stuff. It's comics I grew up on. So um, that's when I knew that, you know, yeah, this, this is what I want to do for a living. I mean, by that stage, I had loads of books published, but comics are, uh, yeah, I love the comics more. You know? So what, what, was your, what was your route just before that? So what... Um, well, I left school at 16 uh, to join the post office. I was a telegram boy, then I was a postman. Uh, in 1983, I bought myself a home computer, taught myself to program that, got a job as a programmer, stayed in the computer industry for 14, 15 years till a bunch of us were made redundant. At that stage, I had a couple of book deals on the go, and um, I just said, well, I'll finish this book, and then i look for a job. And that was 1999. I still haven't looked. So um, that's how I, I kind of fell into this. Or was dragged in, kicking and screaming and crying, actually. And one day, any day now, I hope to earn as much as I did as a programmer 20 years ago. So, so you, you have a, you can tank, you're the, you've the odd, uh, odd thing of being able to tank Adolf Hitler for your uh, 2008 AD stint. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Can, can we edit that bit? <laughs> uh, t- time traveling Adolf Hitler. Well, like, I can't believe you just said Adolf Hitler wasn't all that bad. Yeah. Incredible. I, I don't I don't know why you always loved him so much, David. I just can't see that, you know. I don't even know what you get out of it. <laughs> so PJ, how um how at, you, last. at last. last. Look you had that, had that pipe where Lads, we can sleep now. <laughs> <laughs> so cap uh, yourself in, this is a long one. <laughs> so <laughs> I asked Thard for some work and he went, Okay, the end. Um <laughs> I, That's like so a lot of people, I, I grew up reading 2000 AD, wanted to draw for 2000 AD, um, like Mike, find myself working in IT for years, uh, but it, and equally it paid a lot better than drawing. Um, around 97, I think, I, I saw an advert in a, 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 a was it, Comics International, looking for a, an artist to do some fan art for a Judge Dredd fanzine, class of 79. And I, I kind of had stopped drawing around then and decided I'd pick it back up again. And then around 2000, I thought I have to get a little bit more serious. Uh, so I found a part-time job that, that paid quite well. And I thought what I'll do is the rest of the time I'll draw comics. Is I'll try and draw comics and try and get work for 2080. Uh, by that stage, I'd already done some small press stuff with Gordon Rennie, um, who had written, I mean, I, the, the truth of this is I was asked uh, to do a small press story for uh, a magazine called Violent by Mike Severe. Severe. Uh, and uh, Mike had said, I've got two scripts, right? So one of them's by this writer and it's a great script. And the other one's by Gordon Rennie. And I went, well, I hang on, Gordon Rennie who's written for 2080. And he went, yeah, I went, I'll have that one. Thank you very much. So I don't know who the other one is. I can't remember. Might've been Alan Moore. Might've been all you. <laughs> I do not know. But I went with Gordon Rennie, and then um, from doing that with Gordon, doing some small press stuff, Gordon would sort of continue, he would suggest things to, uh, for my name up in, in, you know, in scripts and stuff. But nothing ever got bitten. Uh, went to Dreadcon in 2000, I think. Uh, Andy Diggle was editor then, uh, and I had a big. I'd, at that point, I was kind of carried a big stack of artwork with me thinking if he if nothing else he look and go well you're certainly committed i mean it's maybe not good but there's a lot of it and it gets slowly but steadily better um which is not the best approach that is not the way to approach an editor at all you should bring two or three pages of top quality stuff not 600 pages that starts drecky and gets slightly better over time that's a that's a bad mistake but anyway i, I turned up to show andy this stuff and but Andy had already seen, I'd done a drawing online. So in the early days, early 2000, um, I was one of the, I, I was really into the internet, really into computers and stuff. And so I had kind of, I'd got like a webcam set up before people were doing webcams before. Um, there's a page of mine, Mike, show 
Um, before uh, webcams and things, um, I had Mike, basically... Mike, you may stop. talk to make yourself live there to come on it. <laughs> you talk to live. There's, there's one of yeah, PJs there. there. Nice. Mm. Mm. Um, so I, I had, uh, what do you call it? I'd, I'd set up a webcam, like early days of webcams, and I had, this webcam would update every five seconds, and I'd post it on Alt Comics 2018, which was a news group, which was... In those days, that was what social media was. And Andy had watched me draw this Durham Red in really terrible low resolution. And I kind of showed him to him. Just, and, I, and I had all this artwork. And he went, oh, I, I saw you draw that Durham Red online. Yeah, I'll give you some work. And I was like still holding all the end. And he looked at it. I was furious. I was like, what <laughs> all this over on the plane? Um, so I, I came out of that. I was grinning. like I had a, a two-day long grin that left it. My cheeks sore. From, from, if you imagine what I'm like now, but I was younger then and could sustain that happiness for longer. Um, so <laughs> I phoned Gordon and said, hey, Andy said he'd give me some work. And Gordon went, well, I've just sent him a dread. So I'll just ask for you to draw it. I went, All right, then. And that's how I got oh. my first dread. <laughs> really, I mean, I shouldn't have got a dread. Like, that was stupid. I should have got a future shock. Uh, I think, though, that the key thing was you always think that first gig is the really important one but it's not really it's the first gig that you get that comes to you because okay you're a regular now that, that gig where you get where it's not a set of circumstances that led to this one key moment it's like yeah there's some work do you want some work here's some work that that's the really important gig that's the one that marks it as you're not just you're because i i've seen artists that sort of bounce off 2080 they get one or two stories and then poof they're away again and sometimes that's because the, their temperament doesn't match the, the, what they're doing or their artwork is not quite right for 2008 or they, they've just struggled to, because it's a difficult, the, the, the biggest difficulty with, with being an artist uh, for almost anything, but for, for 2008 especially, is that they can't give you that much work. Like if you, even if you're doing an awful lot of work for 2008, you're not doing that much work. And so, you know, even if they're, and let's pretend they're very generous page rates, we'll snicker about that later. But even that with very generous page rates, the maximum amount of work you could do, you're never going to earn that much. And so at the very early days of your career, when you're getting the lowest page rate and you're getting the least amount of work, it's very easy to do one gig and go, ah, I've done my 2080 work now. I need to find a job and then off you go to work in, yeah. you know, in some other industry. If you're lucky, it'll be video games. If you're not, you know, it might be Tesco's. It, it can be, it can be any of those things. There's no shame in any of those things. It just happens to be the way it can happen. Um, so it's that first gig that you get where you go, ah, I, I got the editor emailed me out of the blue thinking you're the right man for that or right woman for that job. That's the, that's the important. So more it was like, because that was the first one. Like, oh, so jealous. Um, I got my my email like that three years later when I was getting married and in, in Barbados and an email came from Matt saying, I have a six part Woog Trooper, do you want to do this? That's when I kind of went, ah, this is the gig that means I'm no longer just that guy who's done two or three dreads. Mm -hmm. So and I think you're right, PJ, that um, I think a lot of people um, uh, in screenwriting terms, there's always this joke, which is um, he's an overnight sensation. It only took him 10 years or her, mm -hmm. 10 years. And, and the thing is that a lot of people hear about you when you do a certain gig, but they haven't heard about the graft, they haven't heard no. about all the other jobs you've done. And everything is like a, is like a step that builds on to something else. Um, I am fully waiting for my overnight success, Maura, and the moment <laughs> it happens, I will tell you all about it. Yeah. That's a, that, that kind of brings me on to the next question. So uh, this COVID-19, uh, try to get an insight, uh, insight of what the day-to-day -day stuff, what you do and how COVID-19 kind of affected. So uh, Mara... Are you asking a bunch of people who lock themselves regularly alone in their rooms for hours and hours on end, how this self-isolation has affected them? Is that the question? I suppose that is the question, yeah. Uh, how, how, did you, how did you get out of it? <laughs> yeah, I, actually, it was, I mean, all joking aside, I think one of the things with uh, being a writer is you have a really good imagination. And uh, when events kick off in the world which are really unsettling, your imagination is 
like primed for this. <laughs> this is what you've been working on your whole life. <laughs> and so I think for me, I actually found it quite stressful because nobody, like anyone else, because I mean, I'm a writer, but I'm a, just a person, you know, there was, it was just such an unusual, weird situation. Um, lockdown, you can't leave your house. And one thing to be in your house doing your work, it's another thing to also have your husband be in the house with you all the time, <laughs> which isn't how it used to be. Uh, so that's a change. And then, you know, you have things like your parents you have to take care of. And so, yeah, I actually found, I found it quite unsettling and uh though i'm and i'm i'm irish but i'm also american i was born in the states but i was mostly raised here um but i have lived and worked in america and the whole protests in the us have also been really it was like oh i'm just getting to grips with COVID 19 and then everything else in the world just started to blow up all over the place <laughs> so it was like this escalation and i think if anything um the biggest lesson I'm learning, and it was one I had learned, but sort of COVID destroyed all my usual coping mechanisms, is you really have to keep your uh, mental health in good order if you're working at home all the time on your own. Um, and also, um, you need to not pay attention to social media as much. I think the biggest... Uh, uh, thing I've worked on again and again and again is, um, you know, social media is great. I'm not going to, you know, just knock it, but I'm just saying it really has to be in moderation and uh, it has to help and inform your life and be useful for you to help other people. Um, but then it comes a time where it just, it's too much and you have to, you know, strike a balance with it. So, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's really interesting because I, I just might just from social media and see different people that yeah, we are we are used to working on our own and stuff, but like some people just couldn't handle this. Uh mm. it's really, really, really strange. So people are coping quite differently, you know. Mm. Um so Owen, what was your uh, your experience in County Cork? Yeah, uh, here in County Cork. Cork was very, very nice now. Um <laughs> Luckily, I had uh, I had signed a contract for a book in January, so I had, I was just starting that. I was sort of in the penciling stages for that when the lockdown began, or when the I suppose, well, when the pandemic broke and it became something that we all had to very obviously pay attention to. Um, <clears throat> so luckily, I had that uh, very nice project which I just finished recently, and then it was kind of quiet for about I would say. When did it even begin? I suppose it was sort of mid February, right? It's, it began. Yeah, it's mid -March, March kind of happened. March, yeah. Oh, sorry, the lockdown happened in March. Yeah, the lockdown happened in March. There was nothing, nothing doing for about three weeks, and then suddenly it got really, really busy, and it hasn't stopped. To be honest, it's bizarre, but this is the busiest I've ever been. Weirdly. So has it has the lockdown kind of put any challenges? Has it made things strange or weird or? <laughs> Something Maura mentioned, it's my wife is now, she's here 24-7 as well. So it, that is definitely different. You know, I used to have that sort of the house to myself. She'd go to work and I'd, you know, close the door and do cartwheels and nothing like that. <laughs> you know yourself. Not naked though, not naked. You, know, you, know, you have the house to yourself and you can sort of just lock yourself into, you know, your, your, your daytime shift. Um, so there's maybe more chances for, for a distraction, but... By and large, I mean, my, my, my routine is the same. I mean, I get briefed online, um, generally speaking. Uh, nearly all my briefs come in via email, so I don't even have to talk on the phone, <laughs> really, which is great. Um, and uh, that was sort of half intended as a joke. I do actually really like people. Um, <laughs> but it, it, by and large, it didn't really change that much. It was just... Um, you know, less traffic going by the windows, really, is what I noticed the most. Very good. And what about yourself, Michael? How did uh, how did it suit you or not suit you? Or yeah, it's what suits me fine. It's it's um, again the same thing. My my wife Loni is uh, now working from home has been since uh, the middle of March, and I have to say it's been brilliant because I I'd always 
sort of feared that one day when she retires or, you know, gets fired for her malfeasance or whatever it is, she gets fired for, <laughs> that I'd, um, she'd be home all day and we'd get sick of each other. But as it is, we're getting on better than we have uh, forever. Um, I get up at about nine uh, in the morning. That's my usual routine. Um, she She's up by eight already working. Um, but she was used to getting up at six and going into work. Wow. So saving around about 15 hours a week travel. That she's, and a lot of that stress from that point of view. But of course, the disadvantage is that she's actually working longer. Um, but yeah, then we're getting on. Right? My work routine hasn't changed much. I haven't been as busy um lately because i kind of keep catching up with all my work and getting it all done um but yeah other than that yeah it, it doesn't have any direct impact on me uh indirectly though yeah because there's a lot more uh a lot more people home in the area you can hear a lot more noise outside but it's not traffic it's uh um uh, children and uh, they're screaming and they want to play <laughs> they're like, what's what's the word for those short having, people the small people. The noise they make. I would never, I would never oh, use the phrase short people in front of you. That would be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, other than that, no, it's, it's, it seems to me fine. I just, I am very much aware that I'm very, very lucky that my job hasn't been impacted because I do have friends who have not been able to work um, and not been able to earn much. Um, so yeah, we, you know, we have to, we have to count our, uh, our, our, our blessings. But at, at the same time, um, why aren't all these people filling their their time by reading my books? I, I, by <laughs> my books, I don't care if they read them. Um, <laughs> and it was really annoying, and I'm sure everybody agrees with me. Is, is when you see all these people, especially in the early days, saying, hmm, "How are you going to fill your time during the lockdown? How am I going to fill my time? Well, I'm bloody working, <laughs> still doing seventy hours a week. Thank you, you know. So, um, yeah, other than that, it's great. Thank you. So, uh, PJ, besides, um practicing in a mirror how to pose well, with a a, a a pipe there a pen but how, how does that how does it affect you well you see like everyone else my partner is with me my wife is uh has been home all the time but unlike everyone else i've got two little tiny people as well who are actually now about the same size as me one of them's taller uh, and so well, that has tiny. been a, one of that has been a struggle <laughs> It's just been a little bit of a struggle. It's easier now, but for a while there, my wife was at home working, and uh, we the kids were at home, being homeschooled, uh, really kind of just sitting in front of the computer, and that's been so. I, and I've been working away, which has been kind of it's pros and cons. I think you know we we haven't been able to go out. Like the biggest distraction is usually somebody saying, "Let's take." If the kids were off, it would be, "Let's go out today somewhere." Oh, drive us somewhere, drive us back, and let's go here. Uh, we haven't been able to do that, so I've been able to get more work done. So you know, it's it's not it's I wouldn't say it's wildly affected uh, things. There are definitely there are projects I know that have died on the vine because of it. There's things that have been harder to do, harder to plan for. Um, we had a uh, been a, um, John Repian had had been chatting to a publisher about a book just before lockdown began and. I, you know, I know that that kind of fizzled out because of lockdown. Um, I Luckily, I've been, like, 2080 have kept me fairly busy the entire time um, as it happened because I think um, I'd kind of I'd just come off the back of a year-long uh, war book with Garth Ennis and um, I kind of thought, do you know what I'd like to do this this next year is to draw some stuff for 2000 AD and do, do dreads and do little strips and, you know, just lots of different things instead of one big long project, lots and lots of different things. Uh, and uh, so, uh, which kind of worked out okay, because there's a few publishers that basically uh, kind of went, right, that down tools were not, were not uh, you know, everyone down tools. I know a few other artists that, that were essentially told, stop whatever you're doing, you're not drawing anything. Uh, whereas 2000 AD have kind of kept chugging along. As it happens, I think 2000 AD had an awful lot of emails from artists from all around the world going, well, I hear you're uh, looking for artists, uh, you know, People who maybe have been told to down tools elsewhere are now available to work. So, um, so I don't know if Matt's email inbox has look has bulged because of that. But um, I say, luckily, I've I've had a few things on. So, uh, and you know that that's been good. Yeah, thanks very much for that, guys. Um, 
so Maury, yeah, I just want to have a, a little chat about people, about what, how they come up with different ideas and how they approach. <laughs> uh, I just in, just in general, just yeah. again, it's more tips for people who uh, are starting out, really, you know. Yeah. Oh, you mean like the classic? Where do you get your ideas from? <laughs> um, I, I, um, I suppose I've always been curious about the world. Um, like it's, I just half the time it's because I think even as a kid I just didn't understand why things were certain ways. So I think classically your brain just starts thinking what if about lots of things. On a day-to-day -day basis, it could be really simple as, um, you know, uh, a conversation you have with somebody triggers an idea in your mind. So you just make a note of that. I mean, I've had situations where I've seen a person on the street and I think, wow, that that's a great character. And then I've built a story around that person I saw walking down the street. Um, and uh, no, not that they would ever know. I mean, there's things like that. So I'm just basically trying to understand things. Um, a lot of it, especially in science fiction, is, you know, it's these kind of experimental stories. Well, what if I change this about that? How would, thing, how would stories unravel from that? So I'm constantly making notes of little bits and pieces and putting them in a file. I'm sure Michael has a very huge uh, file of uh, scraps of bits and pieces. Um, there's ideas that would take, I mean, I've had ideas for stories for a decade, which I haven't written yet, you know. Um, I haven't been able to make work or I haven't had the opportunity for them. I remember someone asked me recently, um, like I've, uh, zombie fiction has always been my kind of least favorite fiction uh, online and everything. And But I've had a zombie story in my mind for years. And, uh, and then someone asked me to do a story and that's actually my thing, my zombie story appeared and I rolled it and then I started working on it. Um, I usually have them in Genesis, a seed idea. And I don't poke at them too hard until I need to do them. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, there's, there's that kind of thing. And then often uh, someone, uh, there's situations where you're just asked to pitch for specific things and you just have to start coming up with ideas. Um, like How can I fit zo that zombie story into Judge Dredd? <laughs> What's that? Oh, Doctor Strange. How no, can that I was a short story. story. It was a prose short story. Yeah. So it, there was no, no zombie, no zombie dread. Oh, that was good. So how would it? Somebody has to have done zombie dread, right? Oh, there how is a zombie dread. dread. Yeah, the walking yeah. dread. Yeah. So there's a zombie. There's a canonical zombie dread from City of the Damned when dread fights a, a zombie by version of himself and then takes it back oh. in time. Oh, more recent than that, there was the Walking Dread. Um, walking Dread, that's great. Yeah, I can't remember who wrote it, but yeah. I, I actually think one of the things with, with uh, people who don't know where your ideas come from is they, they lack the permission in their head to play with ideas. Yeah. They, they just, there's, there's some part of them that goes, there's a thing, I don't have to think about that thing anymore, and that's it. Whereas with, a, with writers, I think they do you sort of playfully start thinking, well, what if that, and then this, and then what, what would happen if this, and then that, and they kind of daydream a story from that, because, uh, yeah, I, and, and the skill really comes into shepherding that daydream into words, marshalling it into, from the idea, from the kind of competing ideas, and kind of nudging them together into a formalized story, that's, that's, a, that's a skill that you develop, but I think the biggest thing is that people don't give themselves permission just to let their minds wander, and another thing, PJ, is very important is that uh, ideas are not stories. So mm. I've had this where I'm in a taxi and I say to the this guy goes, oh, what do you do? And I say, well, I'm a writer. <laughs> goes, I have this great idea. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, here it comes. <laughs> and he'll tell you the idea and then he'll suggest that you write it for him. You know, that yeah, happened yeah. to me. Oh, that, and, uh, that works in animation as well. I've been in taxis where guys, oh, I have this brilliant idea. Yeah, yeah. Why would this Irish version of The Simpsons? Though, there, you should put my mate oh, in your comment. He's brilliant. 
Yeah, so the thing is, but that's um, the thing to take the seed idea and craft it into an actual story, that's the hard work. And uh, sometimes that can take a very long time. I can noodle at an idea for years. Yeah. Um, I, I am a very, I mean, I've, I've written very little, but when I do sit and sort of noodle ideas, I, what I generally do is think, think of a seed of an idea of a thing that's interesting to me and then just latch on to two or three plots from movies that I like and go, <laughs> what, would, what if this and that? So, for example, Murray, you have a really lovely uh, Wicker Man thing. And uh, this is a notion I, I posted on Twitter the other, uh, like a few months ago. I went, oh, what if Batman, but the Wicker Man? What, what if, what if the, the, the Christian cop was Bruce Wayne? What if Bruce Wayne and, and, this, and the, the scary guy who puts him in the Wicker Man is the Scarecrew? What if that was the origin of Batman? That would be a kind of, and it's like a, and, and you just tease the whole thing out in your head. And then a smarter person than you goes, that's stupid. Never, and, and then you forget, you cry. Well, and you forget the time though, Pidge, if you do that and you tell someone else the idea, they don't say that's stupid, they go, that's been done. Yeah. Has it been done? Yeah. That's not I, original. I had one a few years ago um, where I, I just suddenly came to me with those ideas. I used to go, oh, I can't not write this. And it was um, it was very simple. It was uh, basically Superman story, Superman origin story, but instead of Superman's craft from Krypton landing in, um, in the middle of America, it lands in Africa. And the baby mm. is raised by apes. So he's basically tired. Oh, yeah. yeah, and I just thought this is pure gold. I am. <laughs> and I went online to the Wikipedia page to look at the Elseworlds list of uh, thingies, and um, there it's in there. It's like yeah. gold, but someone else has done it. But and it's that, always in the telling, Mike. You you know it's always in the telling. Well, it's, it's true, that, but, that, but that's that's the point. Is that uh, yeah, ideas are. They're ten a penny. Well, not anymore, but they're, they're five a penny. But um, <laughs> ideas are cheap. Um, it's, hmm. it's work that makes an idea into a story. The work is the... Um, I always say, no matter what your idea is, just wrap it around the seven samurai, you'll be golden. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else does that. And yes. Yeah. You know how it's worked? That's one of the Kurosawa movies, for sure. Yeah, that's yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so Owen, how, where did you get your ideas from? So if, if you, just tell me the, the process in 2018, do you get a full script or would you be working with a writer? Do you work with teams or what way? Well, you, you're never going to get anything less than a fully finished, fully worked out, fully approved eyes and you know, dotting the eyes, crossing the T's script. It's all going to be completely nailed down. Um, the only thing that might differ is that one writer might go into more detail than another. But generally speaking, I've been pretty lucky in so far as the scripts, they'll describe what's going on, but they won't say, oh, this is an overhead shot, or this is a wide shot, or this is a low angle shot. Because generally, you, you know, I think generally it's best to leave that to the artist because there's just so much, it's, it's just such a different world and the writer's already got so much to worry about and so many threads to, to, to follow. But um, And if, writer, if writers could draw, oh, and they'd be drawn. We all know that. Exactly. And most writers start off trying to draw, I think, in my experience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's a constant source of jealousy for them all. That's, that's why they're so aggressive to other artists. That's, yeah. that's, that's what it's about. <laughs> One thing I've noticed about the really great writers, though, is they really understand good art. I mean, I was sitting next to, to Gordon at the 40th. Uh, I realize I'm kind of going off uh, subject here, but listening to him talk about art, he really knows what's good and what, what isn't and what works and what doesn't. And he can see through stuff that's maybe, you know, superficially very nice on the surface but doesn't really have the nuts and bolts the old school nuts and bolts he, he really knows no one, no one gordon as i do i would imagine that conversation was all uh, was very enlightening and, very, it's always and, enlightening. and maybe nice maybe maybe would be quite scorchingly hot for, for some artists to hear yeah yeah i'd say so yeah but you know i i've I, I'm you can turn the burn from mars is what i'm saying <laughs> yeah well but I'm always much more happy to work with a writer who is obviously visually literate. And I think you can always tell the difference because they think about things like uh, 
physical geography of a scene. You know, mm. you, know you notice that the writer with a visual sense will, will understand that if he said, well, you know, this is the scene I've described, that by implication something has to exist. Um, but in terms of where do I get my ideas, I mean, obviously my ideas are, are all going to be visual ideas. What I usually do when I'm reading a script is I start to see the characters as actors that I know. So when I started reading The Alienist first, I saw, um, what's that British uh, actor's name? Bill Nye, is that his name? Mm-hmm. Bill Nye. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, S- Sebastian Motherwell. I, I saw him as, as Bill Nye somehow, kind of that kind of right mixture of sort of awkwardness and sort of sophistication and they hit the right physical sort of. And for fantasy creatures, monsters, whatever, I mean, I generally try to think of, the question I always ask myself is, what do I want? What would I really like the reader to, to feel or to see? So if it's a monster that's supposed to evoke a certain kind of fear, I might, you know, there was one creature early on in the one of the early alienist stories that Gordon described as a spider. And I thought, I didn't want to just do it as a 1950s tarantula, because that's too familiar. So I looked at crustaceans and, uh, you know, those nautilus shells, those really, to me, the best aliens are under under the sea. So, you know, I, I tried to make it kind of like a spider, but I just studied arachnids and lobsters and all that kind of undersea life. So... I try to, to to base everything in in nature. So I, I find if you study something that's real, uh, you have a much more better chance of making a fantasy object feel real if, if it's somehow studied from some sort of particular uh, area of, of nature first. That's just what works for me. Very good. No, that's a brilliant process. Um, so Michael, yourself, where do the where do the ideas come from? Yeah, well, the, like, I, like I said, the ideas are cheap. It's, it's how you approach them. Um, I, you, get, you get ideas from everywhere. Um, everybody gets them all the time. But it, you know, it's over, as, a, as a writer, you, it, you kind of train yourself to hold on to the ideas or to recognize which ones have potential. Yesterday, um, my, myself and the, my wife were driving to someone, and uh, I just suddenly got this notion, what if you... Uh, what if you saw there was a car accident and there's police and there's ambulances and as you're going by really slow and staring, you go, I know that person, right? The, this is the person who's been mangled by a truck or whatever on the ground. I think, I know that. I said, I think it's, I might, I'm not sure. And then you go, should I phone their family or not? Mm, that's now, it's, what if it's the person you're going to see, right? So you're going to visit, you know, I don't know, your, your, your friend or whatever, and you think, is that, is that John Joe or whoever down there? I don't know. I mean, should we phone his, his missus? And um, if you don't, and it is, and then she goes, weren't you on that road earlier? <laughs> you know, did, did you come this way. Because obviously she won't be thinking that, because she's going to be going, oh, he's in hospital. Ah, panic, panic, panic. But um, as, a, as, as a writer, then you start running away with this, and you start thinking to yourself, mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, what if it was me and I'd been hurt, but I recovered, and then later on I found out that one of my friends had been driving by, and they thought maybe that was him, but they decided, ah, it might not be. I won't tell his wife this kind of thing. So uh, you uh, you have to turn every idea around. So we switch. And, and and Michael, if you if you were doing that, if that was your idea, and you went, I need this to be a future shot. What if it's you? Well, exactly. <laughs> that's the old that's the old Chatterday idea from Harry Ellison which is mm. where someone rings, accidentally rings their own home phone number and they answer. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, yeah, for, for a science fiction, you can always take uh, that approach. But you, as a writer, every idea, you, you, you train yourself to, to look at it from a different angle. And you go, well, what if it was this? What if it was that? And so on. Um, I mean, what if you, if, yeah, what if it is the person you're going to see and you, and you see it's, it really is them what do you do? I mean, you could do all sorts of things. First of all, you could, well, you could just drive on. You could stop. You could go back and say to them, look, I know this person, you know? And then all of a sudden, then you're kind of in charge of telling your family. And so, on. so, I mean, it's a horrible situation to be in, but you, as a writer, you, you, you train yourself to look at every worst case scenario and every best case. Michael! Scenario. Oh, stop! Who was it on the road? Right? Who was it, though? Was it? Who, who was it? PJ! It was you. <laughs> it's always been you. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it, that's that's a great great uh, was it Peter Stripe's ghost story idea where the uh, the hair said that there's a um, the guy's talking to the girl and he says something like uh, this man is just falling off his chair. <laughs> <laughs> did you just get a script from Matt there, PJ? Did you? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Just ignore me. Keep it's going. Right, jelly and hot shot. That is. Yeah. <laughs> um, you could have to cut yourself down to one or two pens a day, man. It's getting to you. Um, <laughs> Rebase. You see my tongue? It's black. <laughs> <laughs> That's all those lies you've been telling. Free pop boy. <laughs> so, Michael, how would uh, how would you? How would you do stuff in, in terms of 2000 AD? Would you, would Matt give you an outline for a story? Uh, or? No, you almost well. Usually, um, I'll say to him, "I've got an idea that I want to do." Uh, I don't know. It, it dreads that based around a I don't know robot rebellion or something like that. Or in a couple of cases, for example, I did a bit for robot rebellion. Reminds me of one I did with uh, Nick Percival recently. Um, Nick is a brilliant artist. He loves doing really detailed, painted, gritty stuff, and he wanted to do something that was about. Robots. You know, and Owen and I are here, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, anyway, so this is a good artist. <laughs> um, and, uh, but yeah, so, so in, in this case, Nick came to me with an idea of doing a story about robots. I suggested we could do this kind of story. I sent him back a couple of paragraphs, I think. And he liked this idea. So I sent it to Matt and said, this is what me and Nick want to do. Well, I mean, me and PJ have done that, I'm sure, in the past, maybe. And myself and Owen will definitely do it at some point. But we have a specific thing that we, we want. We started, we started, but I don't think there's a thing that we had that we were talking about and then it didn't get there. But that's yeah. There's a good reason for that. This is you know that you were saying about artists, uh, writers being jealous of artists. Well, writers have this great thing when the artists think they can tell a story, you know, that they can write a story. That's loads of fun. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting into this conversation. <laughs> it's on that, Michael. Yeah, so. but generally, yeah, I, I, I send the story idea um, as, a, as a couple of paragraphs, I mean, short paragraphs, to Matt and say, this is where I'm thinking of going, and he'll say yes. I might then flesh it out into more detail, maybe a page, and uh, I, I might be a, a page worth, say, six, 700 words for a four-part dread story, which would be about uh, 24 pages in total, and send that to him and he'll say yes or no, or or do this, or we've got something that's going the same line, so can you take it a different direction? Uh, and again, sometimes Matt says to me, I'm looking for a dread one-off that's about such and such, and so on, and I'll, I will write that. Or it's I'm just looking for a dread, what have you got? So um, yeah, that's how it goes. With things like, um, uh, I'm currently working on uh, Proteus Vex. Uh, well, no, finished Proteus Vex season two. And the new artist, oh, I'm not going to say his name yet, but the new artist has basically been sending me the, the pages as they're coming in, and they're phenomenal. So, um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a case where it's a rare case of, of, of having um, more time than we do with Dread. With Dread, you don't get a chance to see the art before it's printed, usually. Uh, at least I don't. Um, because there's, there's, since there's a dread in every issue of 2000 AD and every issue of the magazine, that's 62 uh, times a year minimum. Um, so there's a very, very fast turnaround. So very often I won't even know who's drawing a script on, or, until it's actually in print. <laughs> that's really exciting. That's really good. Right. Uh, so, PJ, are you still alive there, PJ? I'm still here. Yeah, yeah. I know I went quiet there, but I was still here. So where do you get your ideas from, sir? Me? I find the uh, my ideas start to bounce up uh, the closer to my running out of money happens. I just, <laughs> I, there's a, a sudden, I don't know what, it's like a surge. I, I look at my bank account, I see how low it's getting, and there's a surge, like an electrical volt goes right through me when I start thinking, hmm, rabbits, something about rabbits. I don't know what about rabbits, something about rabbits. I, let me email some writer friends, and I'll... <laughs> No, I mean, generally for me, most of like uh, like one, most of what I do is I get scripts and draw them. Um, I've taken the past couple of years. I I would sometimes talk to writers about ideas and go, here's a thing that might be fun to do. Um, I I mean, I do I do wonder sometimes do they are they humouring me, as Michael apparently was doing, uh, or are they, they are they kind of going, well 
that's all very well and good, Paul, but you mean, come on, stick to your lane. Um, so it's, it's hard to know. And, so, and sometimes I, I, I've written a couple of things for, I did a thing for the 77, which is the, uh, I don't know, we these things small press when they're Kickstarter, which is a, an odd day. There you go. There's some character designs. Michael's now showing. No one's yeah, going to see You may talk, Michael, or you can't see it. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, I've forgotten I've drawn those. Um, I remember those. So, yeah. <laughs> There, there are, sometimes I'll start thinking about a thing and I think that's a, that would be a fun story idea, fun germ of a thing. It's usually me mushing a couple of things together and going, will this work and this work? Um, I've never really written very much. What tends to happen is I, I get through a first draft and go, oh, I think I've got a plot. Um, <clears throat> and then when it comes to writing the thing, I fall apart. So I, I mean, I'm really poor at executing a story idea. I keep thinking though, Paul, you can tell a joke quite well. You can tell an anecdote quite well. Can't you, you know, it can't be that hard to write, but it turns out it is. So who knew? Um, <laughs> and in, th- like in terms of art, when it comes to it comes to artwork, I get the script, I read the script, and I and it, you know, I, I'll get a sense of character from the script. So, you know, if a character in a script is going to be sort of hang doggy or you know uh, the underdog or or uh, some other illusion about dogs, I, I don't know. Um, I will draw, you know, I, I'll, I'll kind of picture them straight away out of the stock of four faces that I draw. I'll just, I'll pick one of those four and <laughs> go with that. And if it's a, a female I'll character... I'll make three. <laughs> I, I mean, it's been a long time since we worked together, Mike. I've got a, the fourth one. Um, it's a black guy. Um, so the, what, I, what I'll do is I will, I will kind of, I, I do have stock faces. We all have stock faces. I, I mean, we mouth them, you know, mush them around and change them. I think as well, writers have sort of, don't want to say stock phrases, but I think they, they have, they have think projects, kind of uh, things they love, love and things they like and things they revisit often. And I have characters I, I like to draw and shapes that I like to do. I like broken nose characters and you know, so inevitably there'll always be a character with a big Hulk and broken nose on my pages. Um, so it's, 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 it's the illusion of lots of ideas. It's, but the reality is it's the same four things over and over again. <laughs> I, always, diff- I always kind of wondered. Sometimes, um, with a hat, sometimes with a pipe, and sometimes <laughs> with a mustache. Good accessories. Oh yeah. I mean, I made them this, I genuinely made the mistake of over accessorizing one character. I put a hat on a hat. When I took a character and went, let's give him some tattoos and a kilt. It was too much. It was too much. Either kilt or tattoos, not both. That was too much. <laughs> I, I always wonder, PJ, do you, like if, if you're working on a character to 2000 AD, do, you, do they give you like character designs or this is what the suit if, looks like? Or? So, if it's someone we've seen before, we'll get character designs. And then generally what I'll do is I'll, I'll start kind of, I'll try and incorporate that design work into how I, how I, how I express my art, which is a very, you know, it's a very up there phrase. What it means is I'm a very limited artist who can only draw a certain way. So I try and start figuring out how I can get my way to match what that other person has done. And sometimes, um, if I'm really lucky, so for example, I kind of think um, if you were going to categorize my art into the schools of 2000 AD artists, I would come under Steve Dillon, you know, so anything that Steve Dillon could do, um, I, I could make a good, you know, I could make a good kind of pass at uh, anything that Brendan McCarthy could do. I don't even know how to get there. So if you give me a Brendan yeah. McCarthy design and go, that's what you're drawing, I will, I, I will really, you know, I will try my hardest, but I will not get there at all. It will just not work for me. And so I'll have to kind of change the character shape a bit. I mean, interestingly, I think if you look at um, the Zenith character designs um, uh, drawn by Steve Yule, designed by Brendan McCarthy, you look at McCarthy's designs, which are very out there, and then you look at how Steve reinterpreted those designs, you can see that process going on where... where the character design is so out there, but it's it's too out there for what Steve's art is normally like. So he, he kind of sort of brings it to to him in a way. So if, if I've got a character design already, it, it'll be that kind of process. It'll be how do I make that work with the kind of um, muscular, musty, broken nosed art style that I have saddled myself with that I can't I can't shake at all. 
Um, and, you know, how do I do delicate and refined when all I can really do is brutal and bruised? You know, so that's, that's and, and if I have to do character design, that's just a, as a matter of me sitting down and figuring out how do I tell the story of this character in one look? Oh, Peter's at the freezing there. Um, I was, do you mind if I ask Owen a question, actually? Uh, that they, they just can be on, seen. Just oh, yeah. on that, oh, sorry, you froze for a minute, PJ. Oh, did I? Yeah, that's why we were like, oops. Uh, this is why I never stopped talking. <laughs> PJ wrecked, PJ wrecked <laughs> the internet. It's like Rock and Ralph there. Me, you know um, I frozen. Just on that thing you were saying, PJ, <clears throat> you, Owen, you've done a lot of kind of 19th century work, which is you'd have style references for background and mm. like do you prefer to ground your so stuff in that kind of, where you have detail or do you also like where you get to do whatever you like like in a science fiction story i assume you mean the alienist right Maura? Yeah. yeah yeah well i mean i'm very much um the first thing that that, that i get from a script is sort of is is an atmosphere and a sensibility and I always do, I also believe in doing a lot of research because yeah. it grounds things in reality. You can also piggyback on far better artists' designs. Um, you know, if you, if you use a piece of architecture that already exists. So it was, it, was, it was a combination of the sensibility of the piece, which was very, for me, 70s comics, early 70s horror comics. Yeah. Um, and also having looked at a lot of uh, new <clears throat> from the time, which featured plate illustrations. So for that reason, it just sort of, it, it intuitively sort of, uh, just sort of seeped into the material. You know what I mean? You know, organic is a very, is a very kind of overused thing, but it, it just felt right, you know? So in, when it feels right, it usually is right, because intuition, I've been doing this long enough to know that intuition is, something is pushing you intuitively towards something is generally right but i'm always led by the material i mean i wouldn't use that that cross-hatching style of the alienist for a dread story because it would look ridiculous you know it would look like you know ye old dread <laughs> with you know i don't know leather things and fur or something it, just, it wouldn't work so it was it's always very much um the sensibility and the atmosphere of the script. Well, one, of the, one of the interesting things I think about um, using actual real reference material is that sometimes the real reference material really runs contrary to what you want the story to do. Mm. So for example, um, I did the, the book that I did with Garth Ennis, The String Bags, one of the characters was, um, so it was two officers, fleet or arm officers that were a cap uniform. And then the third uh, chap was a, he was originally a naval seaman, which is the, the little round hat with the kind of navy, what we all think of when we think of the navy outfit. And the thing is, when you draw that, and you draw those three characters, he looks ridiculous. He looks mm. like a little boy in a, in a little boy suit. And, and <laughs> Garth's going, that's not going to work for this story. It's just not going to work. So we kind of ended up upgrading his rank to petty officer so we could take him out of that sailor uniform and put him into a, a uniform that not quite as classy as the officer's uniform but but similar similar enough so sometimes the, you can do a lot of reference search and, and lots and lots of kind of going through the reference but the expectations of the readers you have to allow for and you have to kind of start building towards those expectations you have to you know if if, if um if a character's, you know, if a character that's supposed to look scary, in reality was quite flouncy looking and delicate and a delicate flower, and 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 you draw that, they're not going to be scary. So you have to figure out how do we, you know, how do we shape that this way. So there's a lot of that, a lot of massaging goes on with even whenever you're using real world reference stuff. I think. So I'd imagine it to be a little bit like um, casting that. Maybe Matt and that kind of puts artists' <laughs> stories come in and to put the artists yeah. like a casting director, really, you know? Mm -hmm. I think it's that what he does, actually, a lot of the time. Um, the editors, they, they, they look at the story and the tone, and I, I guess they know all the artists really well. But it is interesting uh, because I think then I assume for artists, you can feel a bit locked in to certain types of stories, you know, where it must be nice to, instead of doing a 19th century story, to be given some psychedelic, or maybe you would hate that, you know. Have you ever passed on a story, Owen or PJ? 
I have passed them. on a story. No. Are you no. crazy? I assume not. I just no. I've passed on jobs, there's, there's... On commercial jobs, where I said, "Look, you know, I really like this. I can see what you're going, where you're going with this, and I, I love that, you know, genre, etc." But you know, that's not the kind of artist I am. And you're better I, off. I've said, I've right. said almost word for word, and then they've gone, and we'll pay you this, and I've gone. Do you know what? On reflection, I think I'll take that job. <laughs> I would say it's only if I'm busy with if I'm busy if I'm absolutely got nothing on it. I'll say, you know what? I'll do it. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I, th I think that there is a danger of being typecast as a, as a yeah. certain kind of artist. I was genuinely worried. I think at the early days of my career, most of what I'd done had been cartoony stuff, really cartoony stuff, uh, and so it was kind of like going from that to dread didn't seem like a natural fit. And then for a while, I was drawing a monster book, and and then it was here's all the monster stories and it's and then for a little while it was like oh i could if you're doing monsters you can maybe do horror and i was thinking oh yeah i'd be good as a horror artist so it's it's kind of you you, you fall into a typecast and then you fall into a different one for a little while and then a different one for a little while i mean one of the beautiful things about dread i think is that dread stories can be funny or yeah. scary or, or or anything you know they cover the full range and so uh, it's harder to get typecast as an artist who draws funny or only draws this because you can so easily f switch in a dread story from humorous to ominous. You know, you can go from over the top uh, and very, very funny to, oh, this is a real, you know, this is a real beat now. This is a real kind of scary moment, I think. It's what I love about dread. That's, that's excellent, guys. Um, so, Mara, just the, the next question would be, what would be the, what would be the, the dream uh, either short term or long term, the dream gig, <coughs> and uh, what kind of advice would you give someone starting out? Oh my God, starting out! Oh gosh. Uh, well, the classic one is just keep writing, and uh, um, probably the protection when you start is you don't realize your level. <laughs> so the thing is, be optimistic and keep writing, and finish work, and keep on going. If you specifically want to write for comics, then you should um, try and find an artist. And uh, um, that's if you've no experience in any area. Like what I did is I just, I started with a lot of pros and I was actually getting published before I went into comics. Um, so in, in uh, pros. Um, so I kind of learned and I had the masters in screenwriting. So I understood structure and plotting and I think actually for comics, um, structure is really important. And weirdly, comics is kind of technical because um, you have to uh, understand how to break a story down page-wise, you, know? um, uh, you know, how to fit the story into the amount of pages you have, which usually cannot ever change. Uh, rarely it can, but uh, usually it can't. So would you? Um, just a just a technical question. Would you have a page, and would you, would you go? This page is six pounds, or would you go seven pounds, or would you leave that up to the artist? Um, I usually break it down by panel, but that's just for me. Um, and then I expect the artist to do, which is what they will look at it and then say, "Well, actually, I think it needs." less or more and i don't care as long as it's good <laughs> you know that's the the main thing it's a collaboration um and i'm just trying to get stuff out of my head but what i am doing trying to do is there is a kind of narrative pace which i'm trying to break down in the in the in the in the pages and that's what i try to do um i always really like getting input like that where someone will say well i think we should switch this or that and then they do it and it's great and i love that 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 to me is perfect um so, so, so yeah that's the and and i remember hearing a piece of advice uh, a long time ago if you're very new to comics is uh, physically make a comic versus digital and that, because you'll learn a lot from that process um so i think there is an amazing thing when you see a, a physical comic you know and uh so i but you just so if regarding meeting artists then go to this is a very weird era now we're in but normally i would say to people to go to comics jams they're all over ireland you know they used to be <laughs> you'd meet in a pub and people would draw for an hour drink and draw there's a lot of them there's one in galway there's some in dublin 
Cork has a very active uh, comic scene. Um, and just physically make things, write things, um, uh, read, watch podcasts, watch YouTube videos of people talking about their work, uh, read a lot, understand, you know, and immerse yourself in the creative process and just keep going, keep going. So- so very, very briefly, uh, this is my last question to you. What would be the, the dream gig for you? Uh, in comics? Well, in general, what would be the, the ultimate goal? Oh, yeah, you know, the, <laughs> the, the many book series that's translated into every <laughs> media <laughs> possible, TV, film, and then, you know, you've got it made. Um, comics, uh, regarding comics, well, you know, uh, I'd love to. I'd love to write Dread at some point, actually. Um, and uh, but in in other like I do love Rebellion, and I'm happy working with them in lots of ways. So I don't want to diminish that. But if I was to work when you know I, I would love to write. I've done a lot of occult investigators. So someone like um, Doctor Strange or Hellblazer, or you know. Uh, those kinds of characters, uh, Wonder Woman. Whoa, God, that's, that's pretty good. Fun. Thanks a minute, Maura. Uh, so, Owen Coveney, uh, what would be your uh, uh, dream gig, and what would uh, what advice would you give people starting out? Well, uh, I'd start with the the advice starting out. I mean, <clears throat> Maura's dead right. I mean, uh, I think it was Alison Sampson I saw write on Facebook once. And she said, the best way to learn how to draw comics is to draw comics. Mm. I know Stanley Kubrick said the same thing about films. Best way to learn how to, to be a filmmaker is just to make films. Do, do what, what it, this is a compulsion. Let's, let's, let's get that out of the way first. Anybody who's creative, they do it compulsively. They do it because there's a burning desire inside themselves to draw or to write. So you've got to balance the love and the excitement that you feel while doing that against the realization that you're going to be not very good at it at the beginning and to be tough enough to actually reach out to real professionals, show them your work and to listen to their feedback. It's, it's very hard to balance those things, but if you can be tough enough and listen to those people and know that they're trying to help you, then you'll get better. <clears throat> Just keep at it. Don't give up. Just per- be persistent. Don't give up. Um, dream gig, you know, ideally I would love to create something creator own with one of you guys maybe um, and, you know, have it be translated and have it be made into a TV show or a movie or something. That would be really, that would be a, uh, probably the height of, of my dreams, certainly, yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks. Yeah. thanks very much for that. So, Mr. Michael Carroll, uh, what would be your dream gig and what advice would you give to people starting out? Uh, I I kind of have to say the same with the dream gig is get something that actually made into a movie, mm. a good movie. Um, I remember my friend Michael Scott, a uh, famous Irish writer, said, um, "More people will see a bad movie than will read a good book." Um, yeah. So it doesn't matter if the movie isn't great because they'll still make more money on it. Uh, no, I I you know something I um I've already achieved most of my uh, major ambitions writing wise. Um, as in the ambition <clears throat> started out with, but more ambitions come as you go. You, you know, you, I, I mean, I've 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 written Just Dread for many years now, and um, you know, I, I'm very happy with, with most of what I've done. Um, with that, um, I would like to. I, I can't even say how half my ambitions are because it spoils all the stories. Um, I would like to to take his greater hand in steering the future of the Just Dread universe beyond Dread himself as well. Um, but you see, I've already created a lot of stuff. We had the, the Judges series that myself and Maura have worked on and things like that. So um, I'm pretty happy with what I've done. A few more dream gigs. Okay, okay, let's be honest. I want to be the next Targ. Um, so I have full control of everything and then I can fire all the people who have wronged me. <laughs> so that's... Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, that, that, that's right. And, and every interruption is a demerit. <laughs> I hope Matt has a long and successful life. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but but uh, advice for people starting out is you have, if you want to to be a writer, 
you have to do two things and one of them is read and the other one is write because talking about writing is not going to make you a writer the book you're going to write one day is worthless until it's written mm. um, I, I mean well, when myself and Maura first got to know each other we were part of the Irish Science Fiction Association and we were involved in the workshops and things like that and there were people then who were talking about the books that they were they were going to do one day and there's some of those people are still talking about the books that they're going to do one day they still haven't done them um you actually have to apply the seize the pants to the seize the chair play your fingers to the keyboard and write the thing and it <coughs> won't be brilliant the first time around but what happens is you well it's you make it and it's not good you take out the bad parts and you replace yeah. them with good parts and you keep doing that until it's all good um and then you send it away but you can only get that far if you actually write the thing in the first place talking ain't doing um i get very annoyed to people who 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 tell me that they're going to be a writer i go no no you either are a writer or you're not going to be a writer is like saying i'm going to be a person you know I I like hard, you're going to be quite a harsh taskmaster <laughs> well that's what it's like on my planet um so <laughs> But yeah, but you, you have to actually write. And coming up now in November, there's a thing called NaNoWriMo. It happens every November. And it's a kind of a, a worldwide online slap on the back to encourage people to actually complete a, 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 a short novel, 50,000 words. And you've got 30 days to do it if you want to start the 1st November. And if you do 1,500 words a day, you're covered. And anybody can do that because you have to... Um, Give yourself the time. Give yourself permission to, to take the time to do it. Um, I think um, most people can do it. Most people shouldn't, but they can. And uh, <laughs> it's, it, the only way you find out whether or not you shouldn't is by actually doing it. So, you know, talk about doing it. Excellent stuff. So thanks very much for that, Michael. And uh, lastly, we're going to, I feel like uh, Matt Cooper here, we're going to leave the last word with PJ. Uh, so what is your dream job and what advice would you give to people starting out? Well, let's, let's cover some advice. Everyone's covered, I think, you know, about 50% of what's necessary. I think what the other 50% is, marry rich. Just find someone rich, <laughs> marry them, uh, you know, or, or, or I mean, be, become a concubine. Doesn't matter as long as you're kept. That's the, that's the vitally important ingredient for almost all comic creators is that they have a, a spouse or some other partner that they can rely on when the work dries up because it will dry up. Sometimes it may never be wet. That's the problem with, with the freelance career. Um, so yeah, I mean, the harsh reality is you're not gonna make an awful lot of money. You're not gonna make an awful lot of money until you're, you know, you, you, in fact, you may never make an awful lot of money. The, the truth is that um, I, let's see, I've been doing this 20 years. Three years ago was when I started making more money than I worked, uh, than when I worked in computers. And I worked in computers uh, 10 years ago or something. So, and, and I still don't get sick pay or holidays, you know, so. Uh, it is a it's a hard job. It doesn't pay very well. Um, oh, it's right though. It is a it's a calling. As you know, as as you know, as 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 difficult for me sometimes to accept the idea that that this is a calling. This is not a thing. I know that if I was left alone in a room with no other human beings to talk to, after the first three or four hours of talking to myself, I'd probably start making comics because what else am I going to do? It's it's one of those things that's innate within you, and you will do it. Uh, you'll just start creating. But that's I think a, the, the, that's just that's, that's just just the thing I wanted to get across to people. Like people have this thing that uh, if you go to art college and if you don't work full time at art, then you failed. Whereas you could be an engineer or an architect or anything and never do a day's work and what you think. But because you go to art college, or whatever this this kind of myth is out there, and artists and creative people kind of get a, a hard run of that. But you're, you're absolutely just hitting the nail on the head there with all that stuff, PJ. Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, first of all, in my own case, I stopped art education at O-level when I failed my art O-level. That was me done with, with art education. Because frankly, art education and drawing comics are related only tangentially. They're, you know, they're, they're not, there's no correlation between them. I had friends that went to art college and, and I grant that this was the days before animation and video games would have sucked a lot of talent out of art colleges and they went through art college and came out no longer interested in drawing. It is not necessary, it's not essential, 
Uh, what is necessary and what is essential is to start things and finish things. You do not, if you don't have a script, adapt a short story. If you can't find a short story, I've been, uh, this past year out with John Repian, I've been taking tweets that John writes and adapting them into one page uh, uh, comics. I've been doing one of those a week for the past year. There's now 52 of them. I mean, and and all I did was I took a, a 280 letter tweet and turned it into a comic book. That's not beyond the can of a smart person to do. But, and I know that because I'm an idiot and I could do it. So it's not hard. And, and over a year, you've got 52 pages of comics. You put it out there, get it, let, let people see it, let people respond to it, let people hate it or like it or love it or whatever. But you will slowly gather a following. You'll slowly get better. It is not hard to make comics. What is difficult, I think, is allowing yourself um, the idea that doing it is enough. Doing it's got to be enough. It can't be, I'm going to make this and it's going to be a great success because that doesn't really happen. It doesn't, even if you do make something and it's, it's a, it is a great success, in your heart of hearts, you're still thinking, could have been more, could have been bigger. You know, so you will never attain the success that you think you're going to get. What you will attain, though, is you'll get to finish the things you want to make. You'll get to make things. You'll get to spend every day drawing. You'll get to spend every day making up something. And, and I, I mean, I, I, I can't uh, talk about the project I'm doing right now, but it's making me laugh my legs off just thinking about it. And I did one page, which I, la I laughed so hard at, thinking, there's no way they'll let me do this. But they apparently are going to let me do it, so that's fine. So it, it's, it's a difficult career. It doesn't pay particularly well, even if you're relatively successful. I think from outside, people might look at me and go, there's a guy who's relatively successful in terms of 2008. I've been at it for, for X amount of time, but only because I've got a very low, low mortgage. I've got a very forgiving partner. Um, and, you know, I, I came from a background of working in IT where I could, I could earn money while I was training myself how to do comics. So... It, it is difficult. It is hard. You will uh, not make an awful lot of money. I'm, I'm putting people off now. That's all I'm doing. I'm putting people well, that, off. But these are harsh realities. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I mean Ireland, that's the thing. Uh, when you were saying earlier, we're going to find out names or we're going to put them off. All we really have to do is tell them the truth about how hard it is because it's <laughs> bloody hard. Uh, I, I think in Ireland, the stat is the revenue has said the average Irish writer artist um, is on, gets under 10,000 a year. Yeah. That's the reality. Yeah. Reality. The vast majority, I mean, about 80%. Wow. Everyone in England is deeply envious of the fact that uh, the Irish government have essentially said artists can, yeah, I mean, let's, let's make it nice and simple, but they've basically said artists can work tax free. What they haven't really realized is how little artists earn. They don't, they don't really earn that much to pay enough taxes to make any exactly. difference. That's right. All right, folks. Listen, this is absolutely brilliant. Listen, folks, this is the first special, and you guys have absolutely been stars for us. So, just myself and uh, Kelly Conn would like to thank you all for taking part of this. And uh, thank you ever so much and sharing advice, and it's been absolutely brilliant. So, hopefully, when we get the physical events, keep going that uh, we'll someday get you as guests at Celtic Con or yes. returning guests. Uh, so guys listen thanks very much and that i'm going to just going to leave you all on that and uh thanks very much for uh june fest for holding this uh webinar and for steve in the background and watching all the technical stuff and to calera county council for supporting with us with the art Arts grant and uh thanks very much this has been episode three of lockdown chats the 2018 special and we'll see you again thanks very much folks